Hello and welcome to the Tudors Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to my show. For those who are new to my podcast, I take a minute at the beginning of every show to thank the people who have been generous enough to donate and become patrons to keep the show going. I'd like to thank Sari, Suke, Johanna, Doris, Courtney, Anastasia, Anna, Bob, Diana, Christopher, Rachel D, Stacy, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Christine, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa S, Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Heather with the English Renaissance History Podcast, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Melissa C, and Pat B. Thank you guys. Before we start this episode, I need to take a minute to talk a bit about the show. If you're new to my podcast and found me on iTunes, you are missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. So if you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty, and then click on posts. I also have a link to them on TudorsDynasty.com in the menu. If you find me on iTunes, I'd also love to see some more five-star ratings and comments there. The more reviews, the higher I will be on the recommendation list for other Tudor lovers. Without all of your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts. I cannot thank you all enough. Now, it's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website. All the money received from patrons like you goes right back into the show, the cost of running the website, and research materials, including subscriptions to those hidden or hard-to-find documents and books. Believe it or not, I do have a full-time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever-decreasing downtime. Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours a week, so your support is greatly appreciated. Now, if you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon, again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. Now with that, this episode could not have happened without some recommendations from some of my Facebook friends. Uh, I've been struggling lately trying to come up with a topic for this week, and somebody suggested that I talk about what um, interested me in the tutors in the first place. What first inspired me to get started writing about them and reading about them and all the great stuff that goes with that. So with that, let's get on with this show. Sit back and relax and prepare to be transported in time to the beginning of my love of the tutors. The Tudor dynasty began with King Henry VII after his victory at the Battle of Bosworth when the Yorkist king and possible usurper Richard III was killed. Author Nathan Amin recently shared on his Facebook page the following. Now, anything that I say that's in quotes comes from Henry VII's official historian, Polydor Virgil. Now, Amin says... After the Battle of Bosworth, the new King Henry VII spent two days in Leicester with his army recovering. He thereafter led his troops out of the city, quote, graced with the crown he had so gloriously won, end quote, passing through cities such as Coventry, Northampton, and St. Albans on his way south, in each of which he was welcomed by the people, quote, like a triumphing general, end quote. It was reported Henry was, quote, greeted with the greatest joy by all and with, quote, laden tables and overflowing goblets, end quote, before reaching London a fortnight later. On the 3rd of September, 1485, Henry Tudor, the new king of England, made his triumphant entry into London and stayed at Bishop's Palace after giving his thanks to God at St. Paul's Cathedral. It was at Bishop's Palace that Henry led his first Privy Council meeting a meeting of great importance. The king's mother, Margaret Beaufort, and the dowager queen, Elizabeth Woodville, had arranged the marriage of their children prior to the Battle of Bosworth. The Privy Council had an important duty that day. Elizabeth of York was deemed illegitimate by her uncle, Richard III. Now, in order for King Henry VII to marry her, he needed to repeal the act that made Elizabeth and her siblings illegitimate. 
After all, the new King of England could not marry a bastard. Now, that would be no way to start his reign in scandal. Secondly, they needed to obtain a new dispensation from the Pope since Henry and Elizabeth were related in the fourth degree of kinship. As the victor at the Battle of Bosworth, Henry VII sat on a precarious throne. He won the crown on the battlefield and did not hold it through the laws of nature. It was important for him to show that he had the right to wear the crown and that he did not need Elizabeth of York, who was the eldest surviving child of Edward IV. He was very keen to secure his throne on his own. The first example of this is Henry's backdating his reign to the 21st of August, the day before Bosworth. The main purpose of this was to attain his opponents so he could convict them of treason. Since his rule was not stable from the get-go, this tactic eliminated a large group of his opposition who could potentially threaten his rule. Then, to show that he was a merciful king, he issued a general pardon to those traitors who had fought against him at the Battle of Bosworth and released the ones who had been imprisoned. The loyalty of his Yorkist subjects was dependent on Henry VII marrying Elizabeth of York, as had been previously promised and arranged. On the 10th of December 1485, it was announced by the Speaker of the Commons that the king wished to take for himself as wife and consort the noble Elizabeth, daughter of Edward IV, from which marriage, by the grace of God, it is hoped by many that there would arise offspring of the race of kings for comfort of the whole realm. So Elizabeth was not called princess, but consort of the king and the woman who would provide the dynasty with heirs. Then in January 1486, Henry VII married Elizabeth of York. In September of that same year, only nine months after their marriage, Elizabeth of York gave birth to a son, Prince Arthur. It is there that, in my opinion, the entertaining Tudors began. The intent of this podcast is not to teach you the history of the Tudor dynasty. It's to tell you all about what initiated my interest in the Tudors. From the time I was about, mm, I don't know, 10, maybe 11 years old, I had a very keen interest in learning about my family history. On my father's side of the family, somebody had already created a family history book, which went through the centuries. It had, you know, the genealogy trees. It had the breakdown of birth dates, where people were born, when they died. It even had pictures, which of course were my favorite thing to look at. And it had clippings, copies of clippings from newspaper articles with some crazy stories of stuff that had happened to my ancestors, let's say a hundred years ago. I would sit and look at this book for hours and I think my siblings thought it was a little bit crazy because to me, it was just a great story. It was learning about your own past and that kind of history has always interested me. I was never so interested in history when I was in school. And I think that has maybe a lot to do with my teachers. Maybe my teachers didn't necessarily teach me in the way that worked best for me. They didn't make it necessarily as interesting as it could have been. We watched a lot of movies and were required to read history books that didn't really tell the story very well. So in school, I really, you know, wasn't too keen on history. Didn't appreciate it for what it was, of course, until I got much older. Once you find a piece of history that's for you, that interests you, then it kind of broadens the horizons a little bit of history in general. Now I'm much more interested in centuries of history, you know, more recent stuff, later stuff, American history, English history, Russian history. All of that now is much more interesting to me now that I understand the tutors a little bit better. One of the interesting things that I discovered when I was going through this family history book was that most of my family appeared to come from Germany. Now, depending on what you consider first generation, um, my opinion of a first generation American is the first person born here. Some people will say it's the first person who came here. So with that in mind, I'm just going to go with my, my way of thinking. My father is going to be second generation American. His father, my grandfather, was the first person who was born in America. His father and grandfather came to America in 1865 from Germany. 
They then came into Castle Garden, uh, which was in New York um, prior to Ellis Island, because this was in 1865, and traveled all the way across the U.S. I have not been able to find out exactly how they traveled. The trains did not take them all the way to the upper Midwest during that time. So they could have um, just, you know, done it by horse and horse and buggy. It's possible they traveled by rivers. I just don't know. And it, that's one of the things that's really driven me crazy over the years, is not understanding how they got here to where we now live. So they came from Germany. All I've ever known growing up is that my dad's side is German. His father was German, his mother was German, but on my mother's side, we have German and Swiss and some Luxembourgish. So as far as I knew, I was German, Swiss, and Luxembourgish, had that combination in me. A few years ago, my husband actually bought me an Ancestry DNA test because I already have my my family tree created on Ancestry.com. And I thought this one might be a good way to discover more relatives that maybe I didn't know about before, a way to get in touch with people, a way to expand my tree. I was very pleasantly surprised when I got my DNA test results back. I really thought it was going to come back telling me, you know, at least I'm 75% German or Western European. It came back that I'm 61% British. I had no idea. I, I don't even, to this day, I'm not 100% sure where it comes from. I think it comes from my mother's side of the family, but that's beside the point because I was blown away that I was 61% British. And then I'm like 27% Western European. So that was a very, very pleasant surprise. So that's a little bit about my background and the exciting um, information that I found out about being 61% British. When I was pregnant um, with my son in 2003 was about the time that I started once again to be a little bit more interested in the family tree. I wanted my son to have something that would interest him like it interested me, something to tell him the story about his mother's side of the family. That's when I started building my family tree. On Ancestry.com, if you're familiar with it at all, when you create a tree, it pops up little hints. And when you click on those hints, it sometimes can connect you with other trees that other people have made, and you can quickly expand your side of the family, whichever side it is connected to. You can very quickly add all those people to your tree and go back decades, sometimes centuries. This was very interesting to me. At the beginning, of course, I didn't understand that maybe that when people were entering in their family tree information, that they weren't necessarily doing all the research that they needed. They found somewhere, you know, information that somebody was related to them and just automatically threw it into the tree without doing any research to confirm that it was accurate. When I was doing this, I discovered through all of these little hints, all these little leaves um, on Ancestry, that on my mother's side of the family, I was connected to Margaret Tudor, who is Henry VIII's older sister. Margaret became Queen of Scotland when she married James IV. So I was very excited to, to find this connection to Margaret Tudor. A couple years later is when the Tudors premiered on Showtime. So I was about 2007. My son was born in 2004. Um, So I had some time to sit on this a little bit. Still not really fully understanding the Tudors at that time. Knowing who Henry VIII was, but not a whole lot about him. You know, most people, when they first get started, they understand that he's the, the king of England who killed a bunch of his wives. You know, that's usually what you heal. Didn't he just kill a bunch of his wives? Well, no, no, that's, that's not all that he did. You know, he did execute two of his wives, um, but there's a lot more to the Tudor dynasty. So I started watching the Tudors on Showtime and I fell in love with the story the Tudor story to me was just so interesting. And of course, at the time, I didn't know about the historical inaccuracies in um, the storyline of the Tudors on Showtime. So I watched it for what it was. You know, I thought it was a piece of history. It was also a drama and I really enjoyed it. And at the time, I had a co-worker um, at the place that I was working who also enjoyed it and she had been reading Jean Platy books and she introduced me to a few of those books and I started to read them and really enjoyed the topic. I had never really been a huge reader in my adult life. When I was younger I read a lot of books but then you know once I moved out of the house 
I just never really found anything that interested me. And my husband, when he met me, used to joke about that too, about how I wasn't really a reader. And now, of course, I'm completely the opposite. My library is full of tutors books. And that's all I read. People recommend other books to me and I'm just not interested. This is my passion. So I started out with the Jean Platy books. I um, really, really enjoyed those. And at some point I got turned on to Flipper Gregory. I'm not really sure when. It could have been when the other Bolin girl came out um, in the movie theaters in 2008. I know I watched that movie as well. It seems like forever ago. That was a decade ago. I know I watched that as well. Um, did not like that as much as I enjoyed the tutors, but I was still interested in this. So I started reading the Flippa Gregory books on the Cousin series and really started delving into the Plantagenet era with Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville and absolutely loved the series. I loved reading about Richard III and, and Anne Neville and um, as far as Elizabeth Woodville's mother. And I just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It just felt like something that I had to continue learning about. And so I started buying a bunch of books about the Plantagenets. I would go to a Barnes and Noble locally um, often, and I would read the bargain book section. I would stop and, and pick up as many books as I possibly could um, that were just kind of overviews of the time period and read about them and try to learn as much as I could. I would also pick up books that would cover like all the kings and queens of England. I, at that point, I was really broadening my horizons, trying to figure out what era I enjoyed the most because I had really enjoyed learning about Richard III and Edward IV. And then the White Queen series came out. I absolutely loved Rebecca Ferguson as Elizabeth Woodville. And so when this came out and Max Iron starred as Edward IV, I was just ecstatic. I loved that series. I loved the White Queen book. Of all of the cousin series books, to me, my favorite was The White Queen. I, I could read that over and over and over. I loved it. So when the series came out, it was so fun to finally see the story that I had imagined in my head while reading Gregory's books to see it put on the screen. And I, I bought the series uh, once it was available on Blu-ray and I've watched it several times. It's also, I think, available on Netflix. It might not be anymore or Amazon. You can find it on there too. If you're a Prime member, um, you can probably watch The White Queen on there as well. But I really recommend it. If you're, you're looking to learn about the Plantagenets and maybe some of the Wars of the Roses stuff, that, in my opinion, that's a great place to start. Now, Take it with a grain of salt, like any of that, and start purchasing books that maybe are more nonfiction than they are fiction. I really enjoyed reading Gregory's books. Flippa Gregory is an amazing storyteller, but I will agree with other people that if you're taking it as truth, you're not doing yourself justice because you are being given false information in a lot of places. Historical fiction is amazing because it's fun to be able to fill in the blanks for things that we don't know. And that's one of the things that I'm doing with my Thomas Seymour book is I'm filling in the blanks for the things that we just don't have the answers to. And that's one of the things that Gregory, I think, was really good at doing in these stories was coming up with dialogue and explaining things that maybe didn't make sense at the time. So I definitely recommend The White Queen. Then in 2015, Wolf Hall came out on PBS in the U.S. And I had heard a lot of hubbub about it beforehand. I'd heard a lot about Mark Rylance, but I'll be honest, I was not familiar with him at all. I watched Wolf Hall and was blown away by Mark Rylance. I loved the sets. I absolutely love the fact that they use natural lighting during filming. So you have scenes where he's sitting in a dark room at night next to the fireplace. And the only thing that's lighting up the room is that fireplace and maybe one candle. And it makes you feel like, okay, this is what it was like back in the Tudor area. They didn't have electricity. All they had was candlelight. So imagine how different that would have been not to have a room that was just brightly lit. I just... It's fascinating to me. I loved that series. I know a lot of people didn't like it. I've never read Hilary Mantel's books, uh, Wolf Hall or Bringing Up the Bodies. I've never read them. So to me, it was just coming into this with an open mind to learn about Cromwell 
or as Anne Boleyn says in Wolf Hall, Cremwell. And a lot of people make fun of that. But I do think that she had a French accent, at least a little bit for all of her time that she spent in France. So to me, it made it more like um, the real Anne Boleyn, not the ones that we see, you know, on the Tudors or in other things. I really, really enjoyed Wolf Hall. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's it's not as entertaining maybe as the Tudors or the White Queen. It's more just an interesting piece to watch to get a new insight on Cromwell. You know, when I watch the Tudors James Frayne's interpretation or, you know, the writing that was given to him made him more of a harsh person, more unlikable, if you ask me. Whereas in Wolf Hall, Mark Rylance's character of Cromwell that he plays is a lot more likable. And you can see that he's a real person. He's not an evil man. And that was one of the reasons why I loved that show. So I've watched that one a couple of times as well. Then in 2017, of course, The White Princess came out. Okay, so The White Princess was not my favorite book in the series. I didn't even get halfway through it before I put it down because I was so bored by it. In my opinion, that was like one of the worst books that Gregory wrote. I know a lot of people liked it, but in my opinion, I did not enjoy it at all. I couldn't even finish it. And that that's about the time when my opinion of her books really started to change. And I know I also had bought, you know, before that too, I think it was Three Sisters, Three Queens. And I didn't even, I think I got one page in and I didn't even finish it. And it's all just stupid reasons (laughs) why I didn't, why I didn't read it. I opened it and I think I just heard so much negative, you know, negative stuff about her online that it started to get into my head a little bit. And I started to read the book and of all things... I hated the fact that the pages in the book were so thin. It just seemed like they were cutting corners to save money and the paper was so thin that I just didn't even enjoy holding it. I am not really an ebook reader. I enjoy holding a book in my hands, turning the pages and knowing how far I am in a book. Exactly. With an ebook, I feel like it gives you a percentage or it gives you some weird number and you don't really know how far in you are. I like to see progress and I love to hold a book in my hand and I love to put books in a bookcase. I had a hard time with that book. I still have it. And, you know, I'm hoping one day that I'll read it because I'm interested um, in the topic of those those women. But for right now, I'm going to stick with um, most of the nonfiction stuff that I'm doing. But don't get me wrong. Fiction and historical fiction is still my favorite to read. It's it's just a way to escape into the time period. Sometimes I find myself getting bored when I read nonfiction. It's just so full of facts and data that it's hard sometimes to enjoy it. And I feel like I need to take notes. You know, I've always had a problem. Some people are super fast readers and I have never been a fast reader. Sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to comprehend something. I might have to read the same paragraph over a few times. I might need to take notes. And, you know, I just want people to know I'm just like you. (laughs) We're all at different levels and it doesn't necessarily come easy for me. I've never really been a good reader and good comprehend, you know, comprehender. Is that a word? (laughs) Sometimes I feel like I'm just making stuff up as I talk. But I, I really, you know, I enjoy reading a lot. I do read a lot when I have time. Lately, I haven't had as much time to read um, because I've been so busy with my day job or I've been busy getting my son ready for school or I'm busy, you know, doing stuff at home or going out with my husband or whatever it may be. We all have busy lives and I, you know, even I need to be able to find a balance between it all. But my passion, my hobby is always going to be the Tudors and the Plantagenets, but I definitely um, tend to focus more on the Tudors. I do plan in the future to do a podcast on maybe the Wars of the Roses to help you understand a little bit how this is all connected, how it all started. At the beginning of this episode, I talked a little bit about Henry VII and the Battle of Bosworth. Well, there was so much that happened before Bosworth that's 
definitely worthy of discussion. And I want to make sure that I'm here to help you guys understand all of that as well, because some of you might be new to this. Some of you have been doing this for a lot longer than I have, so it may not be as you know interesting to you as it is to somebody who's new to it. But I want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to learn. I really wish that there had been a podcast when I first started getting into this to help me learn a little bit more than, you know, just reading or watching TV series did. So my passion for the tutors started well over a decade ago, and it's probably even stronger now than it has ever been. You all know that my passion for Thomas Seymour is crazy. My my husband and my son, I think um, whenever I mention the tutors or I mention Thomas Seymour, I usually get a small groan, but they have been very supportive. They've never told me, of course, not to read those books or not to blog about it and not to podcast about it. They understand it's this is what makes me happy. And of course, I love them and they make me happy. But this is my my thing. And it makes me very happy to be able to share everything that I've learned with all of you and keep honing my craft. You know, I keep getting more information over the years. Um, The more you write, the better you get. The more podcasts I do, the better I'm going to get. This has really been a work in progress. I never in a million years um, would have thought that I would be doing a podcast. I've been doing this podcast since February of 2017. Can you believe that? I was just telling my husband that I've been doing a podcast now for about a year and almost seven months blows my mind. I really, when I started doing it, I thought maybe I would do a couple. We'll see how people respond to it. I was very pleasantly surprised that people actually responded very well to it. So thank you, because I honestly would never have continued if I didn't get some positive feedback. It's it's really important, no matter what you do for a living, even if it's your day job or if it's just a hobby, to get positive feedback really for me, drives me to do better, drives me to keep going and to provide you guys with new fun information and share as much as I possibly can with all of you. Because I realize that some of you may not have all the resources um, to the, at their disposal that I have. So the least I can do is share as much as I possibly can with all of you. And you guys are all so sweet that you're willing to share information with me as well. I'll be the first to say I don't know everything when it comes to the tutors. I'm still learning as well. And so if we can all come together and share our information with one another, I think that is fantastic. I love it. I love this tutor community. And you have all just been so welcoming and so amazing that I don't want this fad, maybe I don't even know if fad's the right word to use, but this fad of people loving the tutors, I'm so afraid that it's going to crash soon and that people are going to start moving on. There are lots of other dynasties to be interested in, but I just, there's, there's so much in the Tudor dynasty to talk about. There's so many people, there's so many events that I feel like we could talk about them for centuries. I mean, the Tudor dynasty lasted over a hundred years. So why not say, you know, I'll talk about them for a hundred years. I'll live to be 140 and <laughs> we'll just go from there. But that's enough for, of me rambling on about the tutors today. I just wanted to share with all of you, since some of you had asked what got me started, what interests me about the tutors. And um, I just thought I would share that with you. Sorry if this sounds like I'm rambling, but this is the first time I've really done one where I haven't scripted the entire podcast. If you would rather have I, you know, that I do more scripted ones in the future, I'm okay. Just let me know. I'm 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 open. You're not going to hurt my feelings either way. It's all time consuming. No matter what I do, it's all going to take time to put it together. So I would rather have something that you all really enjoy. And I hope I didn't talk too fast. I tend to talk fast when I'm very passionate about something. So if I talk too fast and English isn't your first language, I am very sorry. If I talk too fast and I have an accent to some of you. I'm very sorry again. Um, This one I will not be turning into an article after the fact because I don't really want to transcribe myself talking about all of this in the future. I will write more about Henry VII because I know a lot of you have been interested in that. I do want to write more about Margaret Beaufort and her line. I just recently ordered The House of Beaufort by Nathan Amin, so I'm really excited to read about that. I've been ordering a lot of books again lately. I went through like almost 
two, three months where all I ordered was one. And now once again, I find myself ordering books because I just can't resist. I just want to absorb as much knowledge as I possibly can about all of these people. And it's interesting to find how they're all connected. And that's one of the things that I also discovered, you know, while doing my research on Thomas Seymour is that he's connected to so many people. And I think we forget sometimes that all these people are connected in one way or another, especially if they were at Tudor courts and especially if they were at court during the time of Henry VIII. So once again, with that, I'm going to end that here for this week's podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. Until next time.